Hello all my lovely power cats, and welcome back to Gods and Myths of Northern Europe, part 21. Now before we begin, I have a question to ask. Um, so I've been thinking about making a new video series that's every other Thursday. Um, it would be pertaining to different Norse gods, different giants, um, different folklore creatures. Um, if you want me to do that, I'll let me know in the comments and I'll do it. I'm kind of debating back and forth between it. But anyway, let's get to it. Frey. God of Plenty. At the, at the outset, we are faced with the position, with the question, why a fertility god swished in Denmark in the first century had been replaced in the Viking Age by a fertility god. The written sources represent Frey as the sovereign deity of increase and prosperity, according to Adam of Bremen. His image in the temple at Uppsala was a phallic one. It was the god who dispensed peace and plenty to mortals. It was evoked at marriages. Saxo also tells us that there was worship of Frey at Uppsala. He mentions a great sacrifice ca called Frodeblood, which took place there at regular intervals, which included human victims. He also refers to the worship of Frey accompanied, accompanied by effeminate gestures and clapping of mimes upon the stage, together with the unmanly clatter of bells. This implies some kind of performance, possibly ritual drama, which, which to Saxo and the Danish heroes whom he describes appeared unmanly and debased. It may be noted that men dressed as women and the use of clapping and bells have survived, in, uh, survived into our own time in the annual mumming plays and the dances which go with them, possibly some kind of symbolic drama to ensure the divine blessing on the fruitfulness of the season was once performed at Uppsala in Frey's honor. It's, if some kind of ritual mar marriage formed part of it, it might account for for the horror which Saxo felt for such rites. Saxo and the others also state that the human sacrifice was a part of the cult of the Vanir. In the poem Yngle Gatel, there were puzzling references to a number of early kings of the, of the Swedes being with strange and violent deaths. The Swedes evidently believed that their kings had the power to bring peace and plenty to the land, the power attributed to Frey. It has been suggested that they were regarded in heathen times as the husbands of the fertility goddess, perhaps Freya, Nerthus, or called by some other name, and that they suffered a great, a real, suffered a real or symbolic death in the capacity when their time of supremacy came to an end. If that were indeed the case, then the figure of Freya as the male god of plenty could have evolved gradually out of that of the priest king. Here, however, we are dealing with theories and hypotheses, for which, for we have no clear statement for the, from reliable outside observers that such sacrifices of a king did in fact take place, and no archaeological evidence up to now for the existence of such sacrificial rites in Sweden. We know that Frey was closely associated with the horse cult, and that sacred horses were kept in his sanctuary at Thrand Thrandheim in Norway. When Olaf Turigsvesson arrived there to destroy it, it is said that he found a stallion about to be killed for Frey to eat. The king had a horse brought to him and rode it to the temple. This meant that he defied Frey, since it was forbidden to ride a horse which had been given to the gods. In the sagas, too, we hear of horses kept near Frey's temples in Iceland. The best known story is that of Hrafnkel, who had a stallion dedicated to the god. And at and a stud of twelve mares. Hrafnkel shared all his possessions with Frey, but the horse called Freyfaxi, na main of Frey, was especially sacred, and no one except Hrafnkel might ride them. When Boy did so one occasion, meaning no harm, Hrafnkel felt forced by his vow to slay the defender. The saga shows the dire result of this action and how it brought about Hrafnkel's ruin. For in the end, they, his enemies slew Freyfaxi by pushing him over a cliff. And in his bitterness, Hrafnkel banned the god whom he had worshipped for such devotion. Much of this story is fiction, but must. It's fiction. Fuck. But, but must nevertheless be based on traditions about the cult of Frey, which had, one, which had come down to the storyteller, and as such it would. Such merits our attention. Another horse called Freyfaxi is mentioned in Vatten's 
Dula saga in the sons of Ingamund were represented as worshippers of Frey, and they're said to be in the habit of attending horse fights. It seems likely that the horse contest described in several of the sagas, which aroused great local excitement in certain districts of Iceland, were originally associated with the cult of Frey. Another animal linked with both Frey and his sister Freya was the boar. Freya said by Snorri to have possessed the boar Golenbersti, made by the dwarfs, whose coat shone in the dark, and who, and who could outrun any steed. Freya also had a boar, called Hild Isvin. In the poem Heindel, we, were, we are told that when she wanted to disguise her protege, Altar, the simple, she let him take the shape of her boar. The association of the boar with the de deities of fertility is likely to be very old indeed. In early Sweden and in, in Anglo-Saxon England, the boar possessed special significance, since its image is found in cer on ceremonial objects, as well as, as those used for war and adornment. Helmets of the 7th century are found with images of the boar on them, and some Swedish helmet plates show war warriors who had who have helmets with a large boar on a crest. A boar-crested helmet was, has survived from Anglo-Saxon times, taken from a tumulus at Binti Grange, Derbyshire. The crest is small, but ex exquisitely made, in the form of a little boar in gilded bronze with ruby eyes. It was remembered by, by the Anglo-Saxons that such figures were believed to be, have protective power. For in Beowulf, it is said that the boar on the helmet was there to keep guard over the life of the warrior who wore it. When we find an Anglo-Saxon sword from East Anglia, bearing t three tiny fig figures of the boar stamped on its blade, we may assume that they have been placed there for a similar purpose. Tacitus tells us that the Germanic tribe of Este, who lived on the Prussian coast of the first century, wore figurines, figures, of boars on the, as the emblem of their religion. Such figures may have been masks or helmets which cover the face, such as the, as Plutarch tells us were worn by the Cimbri. He does not indicate what kind of animals the Cimbri shows, but in the life of Caius Marius, describes these helmets as resembling the open jaws of tri terrible beasts of prey and strange animal faces. The boar masks may well be preceded the boar-crested helmet. In Sweden, since one of the warriors on the helmet plate from Vindel is shown wearing a kind of boar mask, with a tusk protruding on one side, it is clear that some kind of boar helmet had significance in Sweden. It was treasured by the early kings. King Ath Athils was said to ha possess a, gi a helmet called Hilde Galter, meaning battle pig, and also to have a heavy neck ring called Severgis, piglet of the Swedes. He won another helmet called Hildisven, Battle Swine, from his opponent, King Ali, and here we have the same name as that of the boar owned by Freya. When we are told that Freya's worshipper, Otar the Simple, disguised himself as her boar, this might be explained by the donning of a boar, ma boar mask by the priest of the Vanir, who thus claimed tra inspiration and protection from the deity. Although the Vanir were not gods of battle, the protection which they offered would no doubt extend into, cr into time of war, and it is noticeable that both Tacitus and Beowulf stressed the protective power of the, hel of the emblem. This has been remembered in Sainwulf's poem, Aline, as Rosemary Cramp pointed out. When Constantine is said to sleep, overshadowed or covered by the boar sign, as it the time he, when he received the vision of the symbol of Christ, he was thus under the protection of the old heathen sign, either on helmet or standard, when he had said, had his revelation of the new power which was to replace the ancient gods. Besides the horse and the boar, a third symbol which belonged to Frey was that of the ship. He was said to have owned the ship Skidbladnir, a vessel large enough to hold all the gods, but able to be folded up when not in use. It kept in a man's pouch. The ship could travel at will in any direction, so it always got a favorable wind, 
It is possible that a cult ship was at the base of this tradition. The kind of ship used in proce processions and followed up when not in use. There is abundant evidence for this ship, for ships carried in processions and kept in churches in Scandinavia from Middle Ages down to modern times. Some of those from Denmark being used for ceremonies or blessings for the fields. And it may be that here we have the tra tradition of Frey's sacred bo boat surviving in Christian setting. Ship is another religious symbol, which can be traced back to the very early times in the north. Cassius knew of a goddess of the Siubi, whose symbol was a boat, and he identified her with Isis, which suggests that that this, she was a fertility goddess. It is possible that the unknown symbol of the goddess Nerthus was a ship, but of this we have no proof. From the time of the Bronze Age onwards, the ship was used in many different forms in funeral ceremonies. Frey himself had ch had close associations with death and burial, as is emphasized by Snorri in Ynglinga Saga. Here we are told that Frey's own death was kept secret from the Swedes for three years, and during that time he lay in a great burial mound, which had a door and three holes in the sides, into which gifts of gold, silver, and copper were placed by the priests. If images of the god were kept in some kind of tomb-like shrine, this may be ex explanation of the statement in Hemskerlinga that the two wooden men were taken from Frey's hoe and one kept in Sweden while the other was taken to Thrandheim in Norway. In Iceland, also some connection was made between Frey and burial mounds. In the Gisla saga, a priest of Frey died. It was said that he was so cherished by Frey that the god would have no frost between them, and so no snow nor frost ever lay on his mound. The wooden man taken to Thrandheim emphasizes the idea of the cult carried westward, from Sweden to Norway. In Norway, farms, rocks, and fields bear Frey's name, and his worship was taken west again by a few settlers who went to Iceland. Place names suggest that his worship did not gain much ground there, for there are only three places known to be called after him. Memory of some of the worshippers, however, has survived in Icelandic sagas. The Rafnkel, who was said to keep horses sacred to Frey, settled in the east in the early 10th century. But whether he was in fact a priest of Frey, or as represented in the saga about him, seems doubtful. A better known worshipper of the god was Thord Frey's Godi, son of Ozir, mentioned in several sagas. His family were known as the Freysingbillingar, but we know no stories about them. The title Frey Godi was also born by Thorgrim, whose death is described in Gisla Saga. He must have been named in honor of Thor, and was in, fa in fact the grandson of Thorolf of Most, the famous worshipper of the god. Thorgrim, however, made friends with Gisli's family, married one of the daughters, became a blood brother of the sons, and must have forsaken Thor for Frey. His temple was in the northwest of Iceland. A, ma a man described as a priest of Frey, though he does not seem to have borne the title was Ingemund. The adventures of whose family born the title and are told in Vatsdala Saga, he is said to have been given a token with Frey's image on it by King Harald Fairhair, and to some come and to have come out of Iceland under the gods' guidance. He built a, a, a temple at Vatsendale in the northwest. None were permitted to take weapons into it, and Ingemund was able to obtain a co coveted sword from a Norwegian visitor, who had unwittingly worn it when entering. Ingemund convinced him that, that he had angered the god and must forfeit his weapon, and the sword became a valued heirloom in the family. Another family of Frey worshippers is described in Viga Glum's saga. They lived in the north, and their fa founder was Helgi the Lean, who claimed to be descended from King Frodi. When he came out to Iceland, he is said to have thrown a boar in a mouse and a so overboard to guide him to land, which suggests that he worshipped Frey. Although we know he was invoked with Thor, he also invoked Thor, and that he was baptized as a Christian. His son Ingjald built Frey a temple, the guardianship of which was inherited by Ingjald's seer and son Glum, the hero of the saga. Glum and his mother also had the right to share in the crops grown in a certain field called Vitargafi which stood near the temple. It was apparently associated with the god. 
The name of this field w has been in interpret interpreted as certain giver, and it must have been especially for a tall one. Things went over badly for Glum, and when he was still a young man, he forsook Frey and went over to the god of his mother's family. It seems likely that th this god was Odin, since his Norwegian grandfather gave him a spear and a sword which said to be lucky, gifts, for gifts and family tre treasures. Glum used the spear to slay an overbearing relative at, in the holy field after he had been denied his share of the grain from it. And so the field was defiled with blood, and the sight implies that Glum aroused for his anger by his deed of violence. He offended the god still further by per turning one of Frey's faithful worshippers off his land by harboring his own son after he had been declared an outlaw, and finally by taking a misleading oath in the name of the gods, and thus breaking faith with them. In the end, he was forced to leave, break forced to leave his land, and it was just thought to be on an account of Frey's enmity. Indeed, Glum was said to have had a dream that the god was sitting on a chair in the, on the seashore, surrounded by a vast crowd, and that he refused to listen to the plea which Glum's dead kinsmen were making to, on his behalf. Thus, it would be seen that the sagas were have preserved memories of fertility cult associated with Frey, which is strongly at variance with the Battle Cult of Odin. Its main lines agree with those of the cult of Nerthus, as described by Tacitus centuries before. The ban against weapons in Frey's temple, his anger when blood is shed on his sacred land, the taboo against outlaws in the, his holy place are all in accordance with his character as a bringer of peace, and we are reminded of the coming of Nerthus, when weapons were put away and peace reigned supreme. Frey is linked also with the, the sun and the fruitful earth. A fertile field stands near his temple, and no frost is allowed to come between him and his faithful worshipper. Well, we are told also that, also that he was connected with the marriage of the birth of children, like Nerthus, who was known as Mother Earth, and intervened in her human affairs. Frey was a deity who brought fertility to men. Frey, again, like Nerthus, inspired joy and devotion. Men rejoiced to share their possessions with them. Finally, the dream of Frey, sitting on a chair by the sea, by the sea reminds of, us of the god who sat in the wagon, and of Nerthus who journeyed around the land to answer men's prayers. This side of Frey's cult is apparent in the story of Gunnar Helming. It, is, it may be noted that the gods' worshippers in Thranheim were eager to, eager to tell off Trygvesson how their god talked to us also and told us future happenings beforehand, and he gave us peace and plenty. The impression made by the prose sources is that the worshippers of Frey were in, a, were in the minority in western Scandinavia, but the, at but that, nevertheless, they were remembered long after the cult had died and the devotion which they gave their god. Okay, that was it. This video is actually longer than I thought it would be. <laughs> um, I'll see you tomorrow um, with more of like, the visual novel. I think we're near the end. I know I told you guys that before, but I lied about it basically because there's more than there, more to the video. Anyway, bye. <laughs>